Acts chapter 2, starting to read at verse 29 to 36. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is there to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, to, for how you've been speaking to us all through this service. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that taught, taught, just puts ideas in our hearts and minds and causes us to, to um, draw closer to you and to, to think about the things you want us to think about. And Lord, I just pray that as we look at your word that you would continue to draw us closer to you, that you would um, give us your thoughts, give us your mind, Help us to know what you want us to learn this morning and to help us to take it with us into the world beyond these walls. Lord, give, please give me the strength to do this and take this time. It's yours, Lord. Do whatever you like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been going through the Apostles' Creed. We've been kind of reciting this creed that the church has recited for centuries and centuries. And the line we want to focus on today, actually two lines, it says, Jesus ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He ascended into heaven and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Now this might be a message that kind of, who's left-handed here today? Anybody? This isn't to offend left-handed people. <laughs> Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. It's hard to be left-handed, apparently, from what I understand, in a right-handed world. I remember there was a Simpsons episode where Ned Flanders, Simpsons' neighbor, um, opened this store. I think it was called the Leftorium, wasn't it, that he, <laughs> he had? It's just tough being left-handed in a right-handed world. My, my dad and my brother, I'm the only male in my family who's right-handed. My dad and my brother are both left-handed. I remember my brother was born and he began to exhibit signs of left-handedness. My mom asked the doctor, should we make him like to be right-handed? Because apparently, generations ago, that was the thing. They would like, if a kid started running with their left hand, they'd smack their hand and make them do it right-handed. But people were, that's I was wrong. People were made to be left-handed. One of my teachers in school, the Bible college, Dr. Bolowell, he, he was a great professor, his lectures were never boring, and he would often go on these rants about various topics, and one day he ranted about the fact that he was left-handed, and just all the things in this world that this world makes so difficult for being left-handed, and this one line I remember he said at the end, he said, I can't even appeal to the Charter of Rights, because, I don't know, you get to be there, it was funny. Jesus ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. We want to look at the importance of what the importance is of the right hand of the Father in a minute. But first, we want to look at the idea that Jesus ascended. He rose from the dead. We talked about his resurrection last week. He rose from the dead in a body that was truly physical. Thomas touched him, touched the, the scars in his hands and the wounds in his side. He ate food, physical food. And yet, there was something be in him that was beyond what we are. He appeared and disappeared from his disciples' view. He went into locked rooms and just appeared. He had a glorified body, a body that was not tainted by sin. It was, some scholars talk about that he had humanity as it was meant to be. And so the disciples watched him ascend, not just in spirit, but in actual physical body. He watched a body defy the laws of gravity and leave the earth. And it's an important conclusion to the story of Christ's death and resurrection. So why is the ascension of Christ important? Well, it's further proof of that he was who he said he was. Remember last week we talked about the resurrection, and a big part of that is that it proved that everything he said and everything he did, did was true, that he was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah. 
And just like the resurrection, it, it, many people um, were eyewitnesses to Jesus having risen, not the actual resurrection, but that appearing after his death. They were eyewitnesses to the ascension who watched him ascend into heaven. And it confirmed what he said many times, that he would return to the Father. It was something he told his disciples many times. So why did he have to do it? Why, did, why couldn't God just say, okay, time for you to come home, snap his fingers, and he would disappear? Or why, why did it have to be an ascension like this? Well, he has gone, first of all, it's because he's gone on ahead to prepare a place for those who trust in him. He has gone, he had to go into the heavens to prepare a place for those who trust in him. John 14, 1 to 3 says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's homes are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. Now, Christianity isn't meant to be what some people would call a fire escape into heaven. Um, it's just not meant to, to avoid the other place. We don't just kind of go, oh good, Jesus has prepared a place for me. Glad that's taken care of. Now let me get back to living my life the way I want to live it. It's not how it works. But it is, it is an extremely important and comforting promise that we have that the minute we put our trust and faith in Christ as our Savior, the minute that we accept that we are sinners and that Christ died on the cross for our personal sins, not just for the sins of the world. The minute we believe that Christ rose from the dead, the minute we make Jesus the Lord of our lives, his promise is that he's prepared a place for us where we can go to be with him forever. And just as Jesus left behind the pain and suffering that this world brought him, so we too, as we trust in him, will arrive at a day when all the pain and all the suffering will cease. He will wipe away, the scripture says, every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things will have passed away. And a new order of things, a new heaven and a new earth will be ours to enjoy in the presence of God forever. Christ ascended in order to go and prepare that place for us. Secondly, Christ ascended so that the Holy Spirit could come. John 16, 7, he tells his disciples, But I tell you the truth, it is for you, your good that I am going away. Unless I go, the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And through the coming of the Holy Spirit, the gospel has been able to be spread throughout the world. There were limitations. We talked a couple of weeks ago about how Jesus was the only 200% person in the world. He was 100% human and 100% God at the very same time. And his, his humanity presented some limitations. Jesus could only work through his disciples and with his disciples through external teaching, through example, through being with them and talking to them. But when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit, John 14, tells us that he's come to live in us and be, uh, and be with us and all of the disciples who follow Christ. And so through the Holy Spirit, Jesus is able to say, like in Matthew 28, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. Through his Spirit, he's able to be with us and work through us. And not just like Jesus being able to be physically with a small group of people, but everyone around the world can experience the Holy Spirit. And through the Spirit, we have comfort. And through the Spirit, we have guidance in our lives. Through the Spirit, we have discernment between right and wrong. Through the Spirit, we have spiritual gifts. Through the Spirit, we have the power to witness. Through the Spirit, we have the presence of the living Christ in our day-to-day -day routine, the day-to-day -day lives. The state of the Spirit-filled Christian today began at the Ascension. Christ ascended so that the Holy Spirit could come and be in and with us. And third, in his Ascension, Christ promised to return. Acts 1.11, which Rob read for us, said, Why do you stand here? The angels came and spoke to the disciples and said, Why do you stand here looking to the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. We'll talk about that more next week because that's the next line of the creed. But the, the promise is that he will return in the same way in the clouds to judge the living and the dead. To take to the place that he's prepared for them those who have walked with him, those who have lived with him in this life so that they can continue to live with him and walk with him in eternity. 
Christ promised that his ascension, that he would return again someday in the same way that he left. So where is he ascended to? Well, the creed tells us and the scripture tells us that he has ascended to the right hand of the Father. Acts 2.33 says he is exalted to the right hand of God. Acts chapter 5.31 says God exalted Jesus to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins. Now what is it that's significant historically about, about the right hand? Well, it's a place of distinction. Someone who sat at the right hand of the king was above the ordinary commoner. It was, he, was, he or she was someone special who was at the right hand of the king. It was a place of honor. The person sitting at the right hand of the king would be looked up to by other people. It was a place of authority and rule and power. The one sitting at the right hand of the king had the same authority as the king. They, they spoke for the king. We use the expression today, someone's right hand man or right hand woman. It means somebody who is a part of what that person is doing and so much a part of, of what they're doing that they have the same authority and the same power to be able to accomplish things. Even the soldiers who mocked Jesus at his crucifixion, before they sent him to the cross, these soldiers whipped him and, and mocked him and placed the crown of thorns on his head and put a purple robe around him and said, the purple being the color of royalty. It's like, oh, if you're the king, here's a crown, here's a robe, ha ah, ah. ha. And they were mocking him and they gave him a staff and they put it in his right hand as a symbol that this was supposed to be your, your ruling scepter, but they just gave him an ordinary stick to mock him. Even they knew that the right hand was that symbol of power and authority. Being at the right hand is a place of proximity. The person sitting at the right hand of the king has the king's ear and is able to give advice and give ideas. It's a place of equal authority and equal power. So what does this tell us about Jesus when we say that he is seated at the right hand of the Father? Well, it tells us that Jesus is in a place of honor and exaltation. Philippians chapter 2 tells us, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It says that one day all the universe will bow before him, and tongues that rejected him and called him false will one day say, Yes, Jesus is Lord. And that's not just something to look forward to in the future, but, but even now as well. What are the implications for us today? How does this apply to us? Well, don't wait. <laughs> Avoid the rush. <laughs> Bow before him now. Acknowledge who he is now, that he's in charge, um, and that he's worthy of our praise. Confess who he is, not just that he's God of all the universe, but that he's my God, that he's your God, that he's my Lord, that he's your Lord, that, that he is the one who's in charge of my life, and I will bow before him because he is in a place of honor and exaltation. Secondly, be, Jesus being at the right hand tells us that he is in a place of authority, rule, and power, not just in the future, but even now. Ephesians 1, 19 to 21 tells us this. God's power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, all power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Jesus' rule and authority exists now as well as in eternity. Colossians 1.17, we looked at that a few weeks ago. In him, all things hold together. No power or dominion has authority over Jesus Christ. He has authority over it all. A couple of weeks ago, youth group was on Halloween night. And sometimes Halloween is associated with ghosts and demons and goblins and, and the devil. And so we talked about the enemy, the devil, and, and how the enemy hates what God loves. And God loves you. Therefore, he hates you and is trying to do all we, he can to trip you up and to get you to think poorly about God and to do your own thing. He's tried to have dominion and authority over us, but Jesus has won. Jesus has already defeated the enemy. First, we see that in the desert temptations where the enemy, that devil comes and tries to tempt Jesus off track and to do things that, that he knew that God didn't want him to do, and he, he rejected those temptations. 
We see how Jesus defeated the enemy at the cross, and he defeated the enemy at the resurrection, rising from the dead, and finally at the ascension, Jesus sits at God's right hand, wielding all the authority that God has because he is God. He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, Philippians 2 tells us, because he already had it. 1 Peter 3 says, Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. And that's the thing that we humans have this wonderful gift called free will. And it can be amazing sometimes, and it can be really to our detriment sometimes. And angels and authorities and powers are in submission to him, but so many times we aren't as humans, and we don't submit to the God of the universe, to our own, to our God. But this verse confirms that Jesus is God. He has the same authority as God. This world ultimately lives in submission to him. How, what are the implications for us here in the 21st century? Well, if the spirit of Christ lives in us, we don't have to fear the spirit of darkness, the powers of darkness. We don't have to fear whatever dominions and principalities might be out there. I told this story at youth group that, and I've heard this story told three different times, and each time it has a different person as the main character. So I don't think it's made up. <laughs> I think it's just, it was told once, and then they kind of, people forgot who the main character was. But the last time I heard this story, the guy's name was Smith Wigglesworth. And I just say that because I like saying Wigglesworth because it's just a fun name to say. But anyway, it tells this story that he was so close to God. And so, you know, he was known as a man of God that one day he was stirred from his bed to look at the foot of his bed to, and sense something very, very dark. And as he kind of rubbed his eyes and woke up, he realized that the devil himself was standing before him. And his response was, oh, it's only you. And he turned over and went back to sleep. There is this trust that he knew and that we can know too that we don't have to fear any of the powers of darkness and evil that are out there because Jesus has already defeated them. And we can trust that, in the, and we've talked about this, this has come up a number of times, in situations that seem out of control, in the middle of World War I, in the middle of our lives, our battles and our struggles where things seem out of control, we can trust that Christ is in control that he's already defeated the enemy. And I know that's hard to see sometimes. I know when you're in the middle of stuff that it's really hard to understand that, that God is in control. The power of the cross, the power of the resurrection, the power of the ascension, the word of God tells us that he is ultimately in control and that we will see his hand of victory in our lives here on earth and the world to come. He is in control. Jesus being at, his, at God's right hand tells us that it's a place where his enemies are under his feet. Psalm 110 one says, the, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. In modern in Middle Eastern culture, there's nothing more demeaning than to be under the foot of someone. When Iraq fell a few years ago and a bunch of people from Baghdad, they knocked down the statue of Saddam Hussein. And I remember watching on the news, they took their shoes off and just started beating it with their shoes. The sole of the shoe is just the most demeaning, humiliating thing. One time, President Bush was doing a news conference in the Middle East and someone who didn't like him threw his shoe at him because that was a demeaning, humiliating thing to happen. It's a sign of total disregard. It's a sign of humiliation. It's a sign of total conquering. But Jesus, God made the prophetic promise in Psalm 110 that Jesus' enemies would be a footstool for his feet. Now, in Psalm 110, it's referring initially to David. And this is an a, a important lesson to learn about understanding the scripture, that sometimes we see things in the Old Testament and we kind of go, oh, that kind of looks like what's happening today, and we kind of draw the parallel. But not every scripture in the Old Testament was meant to be prophetic. Not every scripture in the Old Testament was made to draw a parallel to today. How you can be sure of that, theologians call it senses plenier, but how you can be sure that the Old Testament passages mean something more than what it says is if it's quoted in the New Testament and given a new meaning. And this ver passage about uh, having the enemies at, at your feet is quoted three times in the New Testament in reference to Jesus as well. So we could know that this passage in Psalms it's not only talking about King David, but it's also talking prophetically about Jesus. So Jesus has stomped the enemy under his feet. When I was in as a kid or in youth group, we used to sing this song about how Jesus has, has 
I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. And then we sing, he's under my feet, he's under my feet, Satan is under my feet, and we would all jump and stomp our feet and, and just as a, as a, to drive that point home. Now, who are the enemies of God that talk about that are under our feet? Well, they're not people. They're not people. Some churches and some Christians can sometimes stomp down on people and treat them as the enemy. And Rob was talking about what happened in World War I. And in all of these wars, it's people that end up suffering, and we end up killing people, but it's not people who are the enemy. It's like he said, it's, it's the, the evil that is unleashed. The enemies of God are Satan and his demons that were unleashed at the beginning of World War I, and who try to thwart God's purposes and lead the world in a different way. And it's the works of the enemy that are done through people, and that's why sometimes we get messed up, and we kind of, we, we harp, we we treat people like the enemy, but it's, it's the things that they're doing that the enemy is working through them, often unconsciously on their part. Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our struggle is against spiritual authorities, and Christ has already defeated these authorities. They are under his feet. And the implications for us in the 21st century is that we can live the victory that Christ has already won for us. We can know that his enemies, the devil and his demons who hate us, are under his feet. And consequently, we have nothing. We have nothing to fear. Finally, Jesus, Scripture says that Jesus is in a place at the Father's right hand where he intercedes on our behalf. Romans 8.34 says, Christ Jesus, who was raised to life, He's at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. What's that mean, intercede? Well, that means he's praying for us. He's acting to intercede us to act as the go-between. And this happens on two levels with Jesus. First, he's already, he acts as the go-between between us and God because of our sin problem. He, sub, he was our substitute on the cross. We should have died on the cross for our sins, but he took our place. He interceded for us. And secondly, he intercedes for us in the problems and issues of our day-to-day -day lives. Hebrews 4 talks about how he sympathizes with us and how he gives us the ability to come to the throne of grace and to find mercy and help in our time of need. Through Jesus, we have access to the creator of the universe and all the power that is there. What are the implications for us? Well, just know that there's always someone praying for you. Even if there's no human person who knows what you're going through, there is always someone taking your problem to God and, and, say, and praying for you. There's somebody who's always in your corner, and that's Jesus Christ. He promises he will never leave us, and he will never forsake us. The Psalms tell us a number of things that happen at God's right hand. He sustains us through his right hand. At his right hand is fullness of joy. Salvation is at his right hand. Our help is at his right hand. He does mighty things through his right hand. We are filled with righteousness at his right hand. So Jesus is at the right hand of God, assuring that we have access to all of these benefits through his death and through his resurrection and through his ascension to the Father's right hand. So Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of the Father, where every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus has been given all authority. We can trust that he is in control. Jesus has had his enemies placed under his feet, and because of that, we have nothing to fear. Jesus is ever interceding for us, praying for us, giving us access to all we need from the Father. And in his ascension to the right hand of the Father, Jesus provides us with an example. Now, Jesus is completely unique, and, and our lives don't mirror his exactly. But it's often the case, like Jesus, that exaltation, that reaching the mountaintop in our lives off only follows going through the valley, only follows going through humiliation, going through tough times. And God has promised to lift us up, to uphold us, to sustain us. And sometimes that seems slow in coming when circumstances are difficult and circumstances are painful. And Jesus went through difficult circumstances that we'll never be able to comprehend. And yet, at the end of it all, as he was obedient, the Father exalted him. So looking at Jesus' example, not only as an example, but by his Holy Spirit, he gives us the power to be able to hold on through the fire and hold on 
through the storm and hold on through the difficult times and hold on through the trying times in life because God will sustain you. He will lift you up in this life and he will lift you up for certain in the next. So the ascension of Christ to the Father's right hand assures us that we too, in him, will have the Holy Spirit within us to walk with us and to lift us up in all of life's trials. And at the end of it all, we will see that it is only the beginning of that place that Christ has prepared for us for eternity. Would you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for going through all we've talked about in the last few weeks, your death and your the resurrection and now your ascension to the Father. Thank you, Lord, that in going, you sent your Holy Spirit to live in us and to live through us. Thank you, Lord, that in leaving you, you go to prepare a place for us, that we can have assurance to, as we are with you in this life, we can be with you forever. Thank you, Lord, that you are seated at the right hand of the Father and that you are always interceding for us, praying for us, presenting our case to the creator of the universe. Thank you, Lord, that you are always in control. And I pray, Lord, that you would remind us of that when things seem out of control, when we don't know where the money is going to come from, when we don't know how our health is going to change, when we don't know how that son or daughter is going to turn out in their, in their life, when we, when we worry about things. Lord, just remind us that you have all things under control. And that you have won the victory, that Satan is under your feet. The powers of darkness are under your feet. And even though they have the opportunity to do stuff, they can't do all stuff. And so I thank you, Lord, that you are in control. And Lord, we bow before you now. We're not going to wait till when everyone does it at the end of time. We bow before you now and we acknowledge that you are Lord that you are master, that you are savior, not just of the world, but of us. Help us, Lord, to live lives by your spirit that, that manifest the fact that you are in charge of us. Help us to obey. Help us to live the life that you created us to live. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for, for all you've done for us, both now and the promise of eternity. In Jesus' name. Amen.